Here we go. Today is Sunday, May 27th, 2018. This is episode 218 of the Defensive Security Podcast. My name is Jerry Bell, and joining me tonight, as always, is Mr. Andrew Callett. Good evening, Jerry, and I'm not sure I still remember how to do this. I, it has been an incredibly long time. I know. I, I, I bet people have given us up for dead. I, uh, I and, and by the way, I... I, I do apologize. It's mostly been my fault, not entirely, but mostly. Um, and, and a lot of it, by the way, is um, I, I had I had fully intended to record over the past couple of weeks and make um, you know, make announcements about the impending uh, implementation date of the GDPR, which is now a couple of days behind us. But you know, honestly, that's kept me and the rest of the civilized world in IT, I think, pretty busy. Speaking of GDPR, do we have a current casualty count? Uh, no, there's, um, uh, there's apparently, uh, uh, shortly after it went into effect, uh, a, a lawyer named Max Schrems from Austria, who's a, who's a pretty well-known privacy activist filed suit against Google and Facebook on a whole bunch of different, uh, accounts, but you know, that's really early days. So is there like an ETF I can get in on for those kind of lawsuits? I've been, I've been wondering uh, if there's a way to, you know, to play arbitrage against uh, European bonds. I gotta or, wonder or something. I gotta wonder why we can't crowdsource legal efforts yet for, you know, class action legal effort crowdsourcing. Maybe we can, and I just don't know it. I'm, I suspect we can. There's probably violating some ethic ethics rules there, but I, I would also think so too. Yes. But I mean, it is amazing watching all the different companies sort of respond to GDPR. Uh, I think somebody posted, and I forget who, and I apologize, I should give them credit, looking at a particular newspaper site for North America and then for Europe, and when they stripped out all the tracking and ads and everything else, it dropped the size of the web page by like 90%. Yeah, it went from like five and a half megabytes to like 500 kilobytes and loaded like uh, 10 times faster. So, um, and, and also there, some other bit of news was that, um, on, on Friday that the 25th, when the, the law went into effect, people were, uh, were posting screenshots of different websites that were, you know, basically blocking, uh, European IP addresses. So, and, and that was apparently a fairly common thing for a number of different U S based news sites. I think the LA Times was one, and there there are a whole bunch of whole bunch of others. You know, basically saying, you know, notice you're in the in the EU. We're not we're not ready for you yet. <laughs> Come back so, later. So, as a way to comply with the law, they just took themselves out of the market. Yeah, yeah. Which you know, in, in a way, you would say, you know, if you're the LA Times, your target audience probably isn't in Europe anyway. Uh, but 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 again, I think the. I think the the core issue is that you've got a lot of web-based companies that don't have a way to monetize their business if they can't do the stuff that the GDPR is intended to prevent. <laughs> so yeah, I would say though, there's probably a decent chunk of their subscribers who are expats living overseas who want to keep an eye on their local newspaper to see what's going that's on. That's a but. great point. That's a great point. I didn't think about that. You're right. But either way, it it is. It will be interesting watching the fallout and the, the unintended consequences and the reverberations of GDPR as it gets over. And I think as we start to see some some actions being taken by the regulators, we'll start to figure out what it really truly means. Yeah, for for yeah. companies to comply. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I mean, as as um, as most people will point out. The May twenty fifth was the beginning of the GDPR, not not the end, right? That was that was the effective date. Now it goes forward. And, and by the way, if you know if you're if you haven't had enough fun with the GDPR, then you have any any uh, 
business dealings in Europe, you, you may want to take a look at the NIS directive because it's almost as fun as the GDPR and, and in some cases has similar types of fines. So, yeah, there you go. All right. So um, just a reminder that the thoughts and opinions we express on the show are ours and do not represent those of our employers. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, one, one thing I would do want to say is thank you very much to our Patreon donors, especially during our uh, – a recent drought. So thank you very much. Uh, yes. Thank you to our Patreon donors. You guys are awesome. Uh, also other, one other housekeeping note, we've switched audio software. We are trying out Zencaster for this show. Yeah. Yeah. So if things seem different, sound different, feel different, that's probably correct. And you know, it'll probably take us a show or two to iron out the wrinkles. So thank you for being patient. All right, so um, so getting into some stories. Obviously, some of these things are a little, you know, probably a little dated by now, but I think they're they're still pretty uh, Im- important to cover. The first one comes from ZDNet here, and the the title is, if I can get up to the top, uh, "Wanna Cry Ransomware Crisis One Year On." Are we ready for the next global cyber uh, cyber attack? So it's hard to believe. But it's actually been uh, almost 13 months ago that um, that WannaCry hit, and we're we're actually really closely approaching the the one year anniversary of NotPetya too. And in you know as the as the anniversary has come up, there's been a whole lot of reflection on what's changed and what's not changed in the past year. And this is just one of the articles that you actually found uh, in in response to that and. You know, the, I would say the the um, the headline or, or the, the common theme between these uh, many of these articles is the underlying problems you know, continue to exist, right? You know, we 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 sure probably have to some extent neutralize this specific thing but even so they you know as the article points out there there have been some recent fairly high profile examples of other companies recently being infected with WannaCry which kind of tells you that you know it's it's not all <laughs> it's not all roses and which is not terribly surprising because you know even today we still see um, you know MS 08067 you know, Conficker running around on networks and, and, you know, that was 10 years ago. Yeah. And I think some of the articles were talking about how there's, there's still recent high level of activity going on with WannaCry, uh, you know, even to this day. So with this sort of underlying incredulous subtext of why can't we get this right? I think it just shows how difficult it can be to sometimes stomp out these vulnerabilities and patch. And, you know, we in the InfoSec community, I think, live in a bit of a bubble, a bit of an echo chamber of, of why can't you just patch? And, well, you know, just patch it. Just, you know, we're hyper aware of this stuff. But I really do think there's a crap ton of corporate entity that just has a lot bigger problems to solve and aren't as worried about this as we are. Uh, and that's why we're going to continue to see stuff like this. Yeah. And I, I, I- I I suspect there's a a very wide a range or a wide array of, of reasons why this this sort of thing is happening. Um, you know, one is one is certainly reluctance to patch. I suspect others is people setting up um, you know new systems that aren't patched, and you know that there's it's probably not that they're going about setting up new systems in the wrong way. They're not you know they're not downloading. Um, uh, you know, up up to date images or, or what have you, and and so we continue to see that you know th- those types of things happening. I, I'm not entirely sure that, especially in the in the aftermath of WannaCry, you know, a lot of the systems that were going to get infected got infected, and so I, I you know, I kind of wonder how how many of the new th- you know the new types of things are uh, the new types of infections are the result of um, you know of, of newly set up systems and I and I by the way I have that same question about MS 08067 infections too I I'm I'm highly skeptical that there's you know big piles of of uh, you know old 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 systems sitting out there I mean you know in in 
in the tens of thousands of numbers rather than system new systems com- constantly being set up and taken offline and getting infected within the first couple of minutes of being connected to the internet. So does that indicate our image build methodology is often incorrect? Our gold images Absolutely. are being updated and you know whether whether it be a VMware image or a, a fresh load off a off a USB drive or Absolutely. even a CD. Uh, Absolutely. And I, yeah. I think that's a I think that's a really significant problem. And I think a lot of IT people don't appreciate how quickly um, how quickly something that is connected to the internet can be compromised you know there I, I think there's a there's still a pervasive view that but in in the minds of many IT people and I think this has gotten worse over the years and not pet yet and wanna cry I think we're wake up calls um, that, that I think there's this pervasive view that you had to be targeted. You know, and and so you know, you had this. You you have people in, uh, in in companies that appear to be benign or or uninteresting, and people, you know, IT people or business leaders are saying, you know, who would want to attack us? And well, maybe no one would, but that's not. <laughs> it doesn't require anybody to want to come after you. So I think that's that's a th- th- there's a lot of different. Uh, challenges. The other thing that struck me with with WannaCry and NotPetya both was the you know the large number of ways that any any particular company could have avoided this. <laughs> you know, the, like with WannaCry in particular, disabling SMB v1, which should have been disabled you know long long time ago. Um, but it's clearly still heavily in effect, and. You know, this goes to something we've talked about a lot, which is, you know, if you're a big window shop, which many companies are, and you're a big enterprise, and you've got, uh, you know, sysadmins running your your AD forest, how much do they, on a day to day basis, get exposure or care or, you know, are driven through whatever sort of incentives to care about? Things like disabling SMB v1 over time. Let's say they've been a. Let's say they set this up under the Windows 2003 days, and they've just been slowly upgrading. And you know, to go and do all the registry settings and the and the changes to disable SMB v1, it's entirely possible that they've never been exposed to that, or don't even know to do that, or never been asked to do that. Absolutely, it works. Why change it? And it's an yeah, you know, the, I, I think the other thing too is that as your environment grows, it becomes more and more complex. And, and the, the inertia, there, there's like this IT inertia. The inertia behind not making a change continues to grow. It, you know, in order to do a competent job of testing, you know, there, there's there's a you know, there, there's definitely I don't know what the ratio is, right? But you know, it's it's a it's a nonlinear relationship between the complexity of turning off something like SMB BV SMB V one. Um, the larger your your network and your environment gets, so um, right, there might be something dependent on that for yeah, like exactly. some old application or whatever, and you may not know, or you may have uncertainty about what relies on it. You're more concerned about production exactly. disruption, right. so better just right. not to touch it. Right. So uh, you know, and the the other one that that um, was concerning, and this this. We see in, coming up in a lot of different contexts, and that is, we we've talked about this in the past. The whole point of of least privilege, right? And we think about least privilege, and often in terms of, how, you know, how, what level of access control do I have? We often think about that less so in terms of firewall rules, and you know, when WannaCry hit the the the, the and at not pay you too, but with WannaCry in particular, it was thought at the time it, to be spread via uh, phishing emails. And it turns out that it was actually being spread uh, over, across the internet to systems that were exposed, uh, Windows vulnerable Windows systems that were exposed um, with you know had SMB ports exposed to the internet, and and uh, and then were often reflection points in you know into uh, the the corporate network and and 
the converse is also true. You know, systems on a corporate network almost never well, should be able to talk SMB outside of your organization. <laughs> And we could sit here and say it's absolutely stunning and unbelievable that uh, an unpatched Windows box or any Windows box has you know SMB ports open to the internet, but it's well, clearly yeah, happened. Absolutely, <laughs> right? So, and, and we can sit in our Ivy Tower and go that should never happen, but the reality is it does happen. It is happening, and we are sucking as an infosec profession at finding, advising, and corralling those boxes to, to stop that sort Correct. of thing. I guess my my point is you know this. WannaCry and not you know we'll just focus on WannaCry right WannaCry wasn't a big a big story in the in the consumer space right I mean these were enterprise companies being taken out in in droves companies that have in by and large large you know mature experienced IT staff and 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 you know infosec staff so. Um, anyway, I, I, you know, I, th- I think there's some sloppiness and, and I suspect that the, the long period of time we had where we, you know, we didn't have worms as a, as a threat probably allowed us to get a little complacent. So. Alternately, we could, we were focusing on different threats. You know, if you, if you look at it as a finite amount of energy you can put, into securing your enterprise. I, I, yeah, I I certainly agree with that, but I would also say that you know, in isolation, the the hygiene that allowed WannaCry to propagate is you know is also reusable in many other types of attacks. I mean, there, you know, if you if you read any if you if you do any types of, uh, of of keeping up with modern techniques like for just as an example <clears throat> it's it's a it's pretty common uh, technique or in vogue right now to try to capture windows credentials you know with you know, with the um, you know the, the the windows bug du jour of trying to get people to click on a link and having the credentials sent across the internet and you know so so there's a there's a lot of um in, I, th- I think there's a lot of reasons why you you want to adopt and embrace a set of best practices and not not simply because of something like this i think this just took a, advantage of things that people should have already been doing and i i mean i get your point you're in and, and you're you're probably right we have finite resources and we're focusing on things that appeared to be the most you know the more important but um I mean, it's, this is what we get when that when we do that, right? But but yeah, yeah, that in itself has an interesting effect. Now you you come, you know, I know we're kind of beating the story on the ground, but the basic hygiene stuff I think mm-hmm. is still very very relevant. And if we could, if if we built our networks with the concept of breach and containment in mind, so we had good segmentation, we had good. You know, limited reach of of devices. We would stop more of these things from being able to spread just by the nature of modern design of security minded networks. But it's incredibly difficult to retrofit that yes. environment to an established yes. enterprise, and that is the challenge, right? Uh, it's I think it's almost probably near impossible to rebuild a network in place with that kind of segmentation in mind, unless you're doing like a data center migration or you're migrating to the cloud or, you know, some sort of event like that allows you to, to re engineer your environment Uh, because it's just so expensive and disruption. disruption. All right. Well, let's move on to the next one, which, which is interesting because it kind of plays the other side a little bit. Uh, The title here is enterprise vulnerability management as effective as random chance. So um, this actually came up, <clears throat> I, I guess it was about a year and a half ago. I don't remember exactly when. It was one of the, not this most recent uh, Verizon data breach report, but I think it was the one before or or maybe two before. Anyway, there, the, the Kenna Security had, I think it was Kenna, 
if, if I'm wrong, I really apologize. But I, the, anyway, the, there was um, there was some at the time fairly controversial claims about uh, uh, vulnerabilities that w- that are exploited in in attacks and, and whatnot. And so this is a kind of a similar a similar play. So Kenna took a look at all of the CVEs that have been created since CVs were being tracked up up to now. There are 120,000. They subtracted out the ones that haven't actually been released yet. They came up with something in the 90,000 range. Um, 90, looks like about 95,000. And they did some they did some analytics and found a couple of interesting things. But I would say that the the headline message is that the way most organizations approach prioritizing which patches they apply in, in terms of you know which which things are the most important to patch the patch first is in terms of preventing exploitation, which is after all why we generally patch, it it's in their in their analysis as effective as random you know as as selecting patches at random to fix. And and basically so what they're what they're really saying is that if you use the CVSS score and categories, vendor categories, as your markers to determine what you're going to you know how you're going to prioritize your patches you would be equally you you would do an equally good job at preventing exploitation if you just ignored cvss in categorization and randomly picked a vulnerability to go fix you know randomly assigned priorities based on the available patches that's that's kind of the this, I would I would say that's the way it sums up to me. Um, there... Yeah, I, I'm really struggling with that concept. I, I I've read it. I, I've read this article two or three times now. I understand what they're saying. I'm just really struggling with accepting it. It does not match up to well, my version of reality. Yeah. And so either either I. Either they're they're looking at things that doesn't match up to my anecdotal evidence, or my anecdotal evidence has led me astray, or I have some sort of bias that has been built in over the years that you must patch vulnerabilities that have logos and theme songs and websites. Well, well I mean that is true because first. you have to. <laughs> your your senior executives will demand it, of course. Yeah, right. But in all honesty, right, you know, I think most programs have this concept of, okay, if it's a CVSS score that, you know, is like 7.5 or above, it must be patched within some small number of days, let's let's say 15 days. And then if it's, you know, 5 to 7.5, you got 30 days. And if it's, you know, 1 to 5, you got 60 days, right? The concept is go after the most damaging ones mm-hmm. first, like the ones that have remote code exploitation and that sort of thing. And this just throws that entire concept up in the air. Now, is that because we suck at it? And 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 even though we have that intention and the, the, the concept is designed well, we implement it badly, kind of like, you know, really good encryption that is implemented badly becomes bad encryption. Uh, or are they just sort of trying to sell their gear well, so I, they have I, a so really I, interesting way of asking I would questions? say that all of the above is is probably true to some extent. I mean, it, it clearly they're here because they're they're trying to sell something, and they're they're claim to fame as you know machine learning stuff in the cloud and whatnot. But I the the thing that I found most interesting, and I and I actually see this when I when I've reflected on the kinds of vulnerabilities that have have um, you know hit the hit organizations we've talked about in the past it kind of it kind of rings true and 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 so the way to think about it is like this N- number 1 only a subset of vulnerabilities are ever exploited right and so yeah it- 
interestingly, the stat from their article is the vast majority of bugs, 77% are never used in exploit and only estimated Correct. 2% right. so that means, are utilized in cyber attacks. So that attacks. means you, you know, if you, if you are mm-hmm. going after all of the high priority bugs first, you know, that let, so let's just put them in high, medium, low category, right? You have, you go after the, you know, the high mm-hmm. priority bugs first you're only covering a percentage, you know, the, a small, a very small percentage of those are actually going to end up being used. And, and so that means, you know, a lot of that stuff is quote, wasted effort, not in the, but you don't know which one is going to be exploited. So it's not really wasted effort. But the point is that I think this is the, this is the, 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 the real point lower severity vulnerabilities are also being exploited in a in a in a more rapid sure uh, way and so you know, more rapid than our patching regimes often allow and so there's this there's this false sense of of urgency that we assign to mediums and lows where you know we kind of think that you know if it's a medium well it's you know it's harder to exploit or the thing the bad things that can happen are, are less severe or, or or what have you. But that's not necessarily the case, right? And and I think that's I think that is the it's not really clearly articulated in this article. And so I think that's one of the you know they, they could have done a better job here. But I think that's the key is there's what what they're really saying is that mediums and lows are also being exploited quickly and and you know we would be better off kind of putting them all into one big pot and drawing them out of a hat than our current approach which puts you know high priority vulnerabilities patch being patched first the medium second and lows third given that lows and mediums are also being exploited you know roughly as fast as highs Yeah, I agree uh, with what you're saying. I think the other thing is that most folks don't take the CVS score and use it as intended, which is to modify the base score Correct. based on your environment and your situation. And most people just take the base score. So when you start mod, by the way, very few people actually have time to do this. And and you might actually read into this article that one of the things that Kenna does is you know automate that process for you, perhaps. Uh, once you start modifying the base scores with your environmental scores, and I think there's another, there's like two other things that feed into it. Uh, clearly, I don't do it because I don't know it off the top of my head. Uh, it can change the severity of the score for your environment, which should guide your approach. Yeah, I think uh, the way I, I, I would say my <laughs> probably probably misread of, of their intention is that they're trying to do some kind of natural language processing on the text of the advisories themselves. <laughs> To try to ferret out things like is this something that could be wormable? How you know is there is is there something that makes this more likely to be exploited than something else, and so on, and that that may be, um, you know, not that that may not come through with the CVSS, you know, because the CVSS score doesn't really tell you, hey, it's already being exploited in the wild, <laughs> right? You know. It just it's a it, it's just a number that tells you right, how right. you know how the severity of of the thing, and so I think that's the yeah. It, it le- right. CVSS does leave some things to be desired, certainly. Well, that's but, uh, but that's it's better what, than nothing. That's, they're saying that it isn't. Uh, you know, the other thing that I know, I know, and that's where I'm struggling. You know, the other thing that, that occurs to me is if only two percent are used in wide. Wide scale cyber attacks, two percent of vulnerabilities, uh, and only 23 percent are ever used in any exploits. It would be interesting to see if we could predict those and use that. I, as I a agree, prioritization yeah, absolutely. Method. And I, I don't know how easy that would be. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would say well, you know that, the, but it would be interesting for me. I mean, this is this is just just Jerry. When, when I when I am looking at for instance the, the the monthly microsoft vulnerabilities i'm you know microsoft will release 
CVSS tens, you know, ten patches all the time, but they're not all rated equal. And and so so the thing that you that, that I try to look at is is to do some kind of an assessment to say is this something that is likely to be wormable. And and you know that that kind of in my mind puts it towards the top of the pile and and you know that's a really blunt heuristic and there's probably much better ways to do it and and whatnot I'm not, not saying that's the you know a great um, you know beacon of light but I, I think the point is for a point of this article is um, there's there's better ways to do this especially when you consider that we do have limited time and resources and we're, you know, we're, we're ultimately patching stuff that's not being and not going to be exploited. Not that we, we don't ever want to patch it. It, in my mind, it it is more likely that it would be, it would behoove us to find a more effective way to prioritize patches in a manner that helps, um, you know, actually prevent exploitation. Yeah, it's a tough topic because if we shift our patching methodology, you know, the bad guys might shift what they go after. So there's, uh, well, that's, there's that's definitely some point too. Yep. gaming here, right? All right. So moving on to our next anyway. story. And the title here uh, it's also comes from ZDNet. Title here is Open Source for Vulnerabilities Plague Enterprise Code Base Systems. You know, so interesting thing. Um, uh, there's a lot of people, and I and I see this happening more. Th- see this view more and more in information security, or maybe it's just IT in general. That open source is better. Open source is more secure and whatnot. And I I would say that in the circles that I run in, which which is you know, t- tends to be heavily regulated spaces, that kind of the opposite is the opposite view is true. We're going to get hate mail from Richard true. Stallman. Then. Probably true. Um, and and it's you know, it, but the, but it's a it's a nuanced issue. It's not necessarily that open source software itself is more or less secure. It's really that its use is more or less secure. And I think that's what this particular article here is pointing out. So there's a there's a company called. I can't tell exactly what the heck this company's name is. It's either Synopsis or Black Duck. Or I don't really know. The report might be named Black Duck. Who, who really knows? Anyway, um, there's a company who, uh, who who commissioned a report. <laughs> when Jerry's tired and get ready right. to go on vacation, he's like, That's I don't right. know what the company name is. The hell of well, it. Well, let me, okay, just easier. for clarity, on Tuesday, Synopsis lawn. released the Black Duck by Synopsis. <laughs> okay. All right. I guess their name is Synopsis. Uh, whatever. What? Clearly, you've not spent time in marketing. Got to brand it. The market. <laughs> Everything is name. Um, so anyway, this is a w- pretty interesting analysis they did. Now, I, I think there's a there's a really and it's not stated in here, but I'm going to point it out. There's a really important bias. That I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll mention in a second. So, so this company did an analysis of a thousand different enterprise applications. Okay, and the bias is that they only analyzed things that I'm guessing they were asked to analyze. Right. So, conversely, there were probably stuff that they weren't asked to analyze because maybe they were worse. So, you know, having that caveat in mind, we shall proceed. Uh, so, th- so of the thousand apps that they looked at, 96% had open source components, which is not surprising, not surprising at all. Which not that much 60% of surprise. Yeah, that, that's fairly had common. Sure. Vulner- you know, 60% of those applications that had open source components uh, had some vulnerability in the, the open source, right? So the, the open source components they were using in 60% of the cases had a vulnerability. Um, hmm. So is that, are they implying at that point then that when companies start grabbing open source components, they don't look as carefully 
at the code bases for patching them and keeping them up to date. Like they sort of outsource the responsibility to, to having having seen fix that this software up close and dealt with a lot of third party vendors. I I actually think that is exactly what's happening. That companies will integrate a bunch of stuff, they'll write their own code, they'll integrate a bunch of open source stuff and they'll they'll release it. And you know that they, they may be on a yearly release cycle or or maybe they're never intending to 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 produce an update because they've sunset that version and you gotta go buy the next version. And and in any any event the, you know the company that the manufacturer of the software is not staying on top of updates of the components because that's a you know it's a lot of work and 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 to keep track of so and to be fair most vulner enterprise vulnerability management scanners don't well they, dig that right. deep necessarily into right. the open source components they may well, I, I should put it, sometimes they will, but let me put it this way. Somebody asked me if my enterprise was using a common open source component yeah, this, in I, I, commercial I think, software. I wouldn't I have a good the, way of answering that question. The answer to that question is that it depends because it depends on the nature of the component and you know and, and how it presents itself in the application. You know, because we just as an example they they talk a lot about the Apache Struts vulnerability, which was the cause, uh, the apparent cause of the Equifax breach um, last, I think, last year or the year before. And you know, a lot of vulnerability scanners, especially in the early days, would would um, would detect it in applications, but it would only detect it if it was in the default location. And so, if you in in you as you are creating your own application and integrating Apache Struts, if you change the places, you know, change the location of, of where Apache struts lived, you know, the, the, the scanner may or may not actually detect it. So, you know, that's, that's one of the big challenges, you know, here is that it's, it's kind of, <laughs> you almost need like, um, you know, heuristic based scanners, you know, vulnerability scanners looking for, um, you know, looking for evidence of a, a particular application regardless of where it may be sitting. Right. If it isn't something common like a, a banner being displayed by an exactly. open source web exactly. server component or something like that, yeah. Makes it tough. Or, or, you know, do enterprise start demanding that their software vendors start disclosing every component that they license and use? Yeah, uh, so, so moving ugly. on, it gets worse. That's, that's a scary, um, tough they, problem. They they found an average of sixty four vulnerabilities per application, which is mind boggling. Um, and and by the way, I suspect I don't know what the median is, right? So that that's the average. That means that you know one could have a thousand, and you know, the others could have just a couple. But we don't we don't really know for sure. Fifty four percent of the, those those vulnerabilities were rated critical, and seventeen percent had a had a logo and a um, you know a, a brand and a, a spokesperson. Yeah, <laughs> right. And thirty three percent appearance agent contained the same Apache stuff for vulnerability as that which was used to attack uh, Equifax. Well, that's that's a great example. You know, your executives come back and say, "Do we have this component?" Well, I can identify it directly in certain circumstances, right. but I may not then, be able then, to identify then it in others. The, which is scary. The coup de gras, which is the, the they did a breakdown of the applications by industry, <laughs> and all of the IT related industries like cybersecurity and internet and mobile applications and internet and software infrastructure were the top offenders for the percent of code base with high security uh, vulnerabilities. Mm. Which, <laughs> which is amazing. Yeah, yes. um, but, you know, I, I would say that this is, um, this is something that we've talked about. I guess we've danced around a little bit. You know, we've talked a lot about the, 
the, the challenges and I think the growing concern around uh, um, supply chain, you know, it's security re- issues related to supply chain. And I think this is a good example of that. When we acquire applications, this is certainly something that we should be asking about, you know, okay, you know, vendor, you, you know, you, you, you're responsible for updating your code, but are you also going, are you also committing to keep the open source components that you've integrated up to date? Uh, so that's, a, you know, that's a, that's a, a good question to ask. And then the other is when, you know, when, when, uh, and by the way, there's, there's really no, that at least that I could sense in here. There's no split of how many of these thousand applications were writ- in-house written or or commercial. I don't. I didn't get a a view on that, but it certainly happens. And so, just like software development companies or you know uh, software vendors will use open source, it's very common for internal IT application development teams to integrate open source. And I think the very same problem happens. You know, and and you, you you probably have more of an opportunity to control it when it's uh, an internal development team. But you know that this is um, this is you know almost a um, well, it's not almost it is a an inventory management problem, right? If you you know if your teams are integrating open source components, they should be keeping a record, and they should be treating those components as uh, you know as, or managing them according to the vulnerability you know, your, your company's vulnerability management program that that sounds like a lot more work how, how does that fit I, into know, the agile framework that's, that's a, that's that's a great <laughs> that sounds like something I, I will the say scrum master should take care of next I, I actually think that agile helps us out a lot in in that you know, because previously, the way. <laughs> yeah, and, and next I'm, you're going to say I'm you start doing CrossFit. I'm going to be a pilot too someday. And I'm thinking about going vegan. Yep. Hey, so, hey. <laughs> uh, so, oh. so anyway, um, uh, where, where, where was I? Uh, agile, agile, yes. So. You were saying so agile. Most of us helps who've been us. around for a long time know the way. Yes. You know, we we we're all pretty familiar with enterprise, enterprisey internal applications following the waterfall methodology, where we would release something about every seven years, or you know, some something like that. Um, agile, I think, gives an opportunity to you know, to actually have a hope and hell of addressing vulnerabilities in components in a much more realistic time interval, you know, because the whole, the whole concept of agile is that you, you release small frequent updates. And if, if you have that kind of. If, if you spend your development resources on addressing vulnerabilities, as opposed uh, to providing new features. You're right. You're right. Which is the fundamental challenge we all have. Where do you spend your time? You know, this is what it keeps coming back to. It's a cultural challenge, not Co- necessarily. Correct, but a, I guess my point is, you're not. It's fundamental it's No longer, it, it, you're not in a situation where you're kicking the can down the road till the next time you're you you release a software or you know an application update because, you know, in in the old model that could be a year away. Well, you have the you have the opportunity. That's true, but I would. You're actually going to take it. Look, man, this feature, if we don't get this feature out, we're going to lose deals. Certainly. We'll deal with your vulnerability true. later. Right, but I would, I, I would also say man. that one of the, um, you know, one of the other things that, and I've seen this, I've seen this make positive change. So I'm, I, I, I maybe am too optimistic, uh, but I have seen, I have seen good come of this. You, you know, when, when you, in the agile world, you've got people touching the code base very commonly or very frequently, right? And and so that ha- that in my experience, that didn't happen in the old you know the old world model of you know of waterfall. Um, you know, it's, you, you may have you may have 
years between people touching a, per, a certain part of the code base. And so, you know, it's time to go upgrade Apache struts and nobody wants to touch that because, you know, it's been five years since, uh, you know, since Sally left and Sally was the only one that knew how that worked. And so I think that's the, that's another uh, potential advantage, but it, like everything else, you know, if you're not going to, if your company's not going to commit to it, then, you know, wh- whatever, it's not going to help, but. Yeah, no, it's fair. So really what we need is agile for active directory management, and then you would solve all the problems for you. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. Yes. All right. Our last story. Bring us home here from from Data Breach Today. Title is Nuance Communication Breach Affected 45,000 Patients. Yes, this is the same Nuance Communication that suffered $92 million in losses as a result of not pet you last year. Uh, they're they're back at it again. Apparently, they had uh, forty six or forty five thousand um, dis- improper disclosure of forty five thousand records, and and so just for those who are uninitiated, right there, uh, the the part of the business that got breached is doing transcription services for uh, medical practices. So these are these are actually. Uh, medical records, which kind of which fall under the the HIPAA regulation here in uh, the U.S., so you know, not not a great look. Apparently, it was a former employee who quote hacked into their system and improperly <laughs> accessed forty five thousand patient records. Yeah, which is uh, which is pretty amazing. Now they didn't they don't go on to say exactly how this person did it, but um, I I I think that since this is going to, um, I believe it's going to be a criminal case, uh, so it will probably hear more about the um, you know the charges or, or you know, the alleged attack. But it sounds to me, if I read between the lines, it sounds to me like this person retained some level of access to the system and after he was no longer employed and um, and that was uh, that was how it happened so yet again um, we, we've seen this quite a few times and and I know I've talked with lots of people who you know one of the one of the things one of the really interesting things about running the show is I get lots of people wanting to share war stories and I hear, a lot of stories about organizations uh, having data breaches, most commonly not reported, as, um, th- that result from not deactivating IDs when people leave. Just turn them off. Turn just, them off. Just turn them off, people. Just turn not them hard. Off. It's not hard. I'm just saying it's not hard. But apparently it is. Do it. Disable. You know, if you don't have to delete it, you don't have to delete it. Change the password, right? You know, to something that the person doesn't know. If you're if you're super afraid that deleting the account is going to break something, change the password. Yeah, well, I think sometimes they don't even know where all the accounts are active. Seems like Active Directory should be able to help with that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we are. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, that's what we're going to start calling it. Yes. Don't you mean agile, agile directory? directory. We're, you know what? Next year they're going to they're going to rename it. No, and we're not no. going to get it. Oh, anyway, kind of uh, or make no, so uh, in the article they talk about uh, how at some point in the future machine learning will save the day. On, on this problem, I don't know how, but in the meantime, deactivate your terminated employees. And if you don't know all the accounts they had, well, you probably have another problem that you need to go solve too. So. 
which gets even more interesting when you start doing a bunch of cloud stuff. Correct. Because then you probably don't have Correct. one federated Correct. directory. And that, by the way, is pretty Unless scary. You, you know, think because to set that up. now they're, you know, you used to you, you used to live in a world where you could turn off the you know access at the firewall or the VPN concentrator, and have some reasonable assurance that they would you know the, a terminated employee wouldn't be able to get in. But that's not true any longer. So. Um, you know, moving to the cloud has some responsibilities Not to come so along much. with it. And that's one of them. So anyway, that is the show for this week. Um, I'm going to be in lovely Honolulu next weekend. So hopefully we can work something out uh, to record again. Yeah. And just a, a special note tomorrow in the United States is Memorial Day which is the day we set aside to honor those who have sacrificed themselves uh, in the armed services and uh, been killed in line of duty. So uh, it's not not appropriate to say happy Memorial Day. It's more appropriate to say uh, this is the day we honor our, our fallen soldiers. So uh, hopefully if you ha- hear this show in any reasonable time, uh, thank you to those who have sacrificed and their families and uh, – uh, we save right. the Veterans Day for for thanking our current uh, yeah, veterans. And, uh, I, I, uh, I second that. So thank That's you. All I can say on that. And I guess you know it would really be to the families at this point. So, right. I know. Indeed. But on to happier notes. You're off on vacation, so enjoy the currently smoldering Hawaii and its lava flows aplenty. Which actually, I think, will be yeah, pretty interesting I, to see. We intend I think if you can get near to, um, it, but it's, you might it's, see a pretty It's been a little fight. frustrating because I have all my life wanted to go to Volcano National Park, and now it is closed. And and the second thing I wanted to go to was to see the USS Alabama, and I just found out today that it, in fact, is closed indefinitely. So, yes, yes. Well, so you well, are having your own National Lampoon's vacation. And you're going to have to go get a pellet gun. That's right. You're going to have to go get a pellet gun and force John Candy to give you a tour. Yes. Go for <laughs> for, def- for, for most watching. young people in the audience, go rent it. All right. Uh, with that, we will talk again next time, hopefully next week. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.